Witches. Hi, hello, and welcome back. Uh, today we are going to learn a little bit more about um, uh, Hawaiian mythology. Yes, it's very interesting. So I will start off the episode with talking about the last two of the brothers. Um, because there's four brothers, and last time we talked about Lono and Ku, um, which are siblings to the two I'm going to talk about, and then uh, Brandy's going to take it away with creation myths and stories, um, and a little bit about Kane, uh, basically the creator of life. So, um, there's probably going to be some overlapping with that, but. Without further ado, Kanaloa. So Kanaloa is um, one of the brothers with Kane, Lono, and Ku. He is associated with the seas and oceans. So basically like Poseidon in a way. Um, he actually holds uh, quite the pivotal role as the god of the sea in the underworld. Um, so he has importance in the cultural narrative of the islands. And I'm actually going to talk about um, a story that... Um, happens with Kane and Kanaloa. Um, so his origins can be traced to the creation of the Hawaiian archipelago arch arch archipelago. <laughs> Even the simplest words I struggle saying. Yeah. Um uh where he had emerged as one of the four major deities sharing this esteemed position with the other three, Kane, Lono, and Ku. Um, beyond being like just completely and utterly associated with ocean, Kanaloa is a multifaceted entity um, with connections to the themes of creation. God, Jesus Christ. <sighs> okay, it's, it's past. Um, themes of creation, death, the underworld, and the very essence of life. Um, so he's one of the primary gods and he actually helped shape the spiritual and cultural landscape of the islands. Um, he is often paired with his brother, Kane, uh, who represents the order and creation of, um, life basically in the, uh, Polynesian area. Um, Kanaloa is the role basic is basically the role of chaos, darkness, and the transformative power um with death. So there's a duality between Kane and Kanaloa, and that's why they're often paired together. Um and it also shows like the balance of life and death and how um there's like a natural order of that and um that's also partially why there are similar, not similar, but that's why Hawaii, Hawaii, Hawaiian, <laughs> Hawaiian, um, culture. I hear the ice cream truck. I was like, what am I hearing? Looks like an ice cream truck is going by. Um, so that's why the Hawaiian, like, uh, I guess the significance in like their culture is based on like thanking what's given to them, putting it into the earth kind of thing, like very um, worshiping of nature. Uh, let's see. So Kanaloa is often uh, represented by the octopus and squid, which like symbolically basically, um, because they are known for their adept navigation of the murky depths with stealth and grace. So this mirrors Kanaloa's own enigmatic nature, emphasizing his role as a deity connected to the mysterious and unseen aspects of the ocean. And there is a lot of that. Um, uh, what is it? So they often portray him when he's not like, you know, symbolically a squid or an octopus, he is portrayed as a tall figure with fair-skinned complexion. Similar to other Hawaiian deities, Kanaloa possesses the ability to assume various physical forms, um, known as Kinolau. Lau, I think. Kinolau. Um, dolphins, whales, bananas, or 
and even the vastness of the ocean itself are all considered manifestations of um which is what the Kino Lau is of Kanaloa. So he has a unique talent for shape shifting. And this kind of gives me like Maui vibes. Um, but I don't think Maui was like I mean, maybe he was like a demigod, like a legitimate demigod, but I don't I think Disney did something. Maui different. is definitely somebody we're gonna be talking about later. He, oh good. He's on our good okay um let's see he's often depicted as a giant octopus when he's not you know shape-shifting across (laughs) anything and everything that he can be um but the fact that the mystery around his physical form is what sets him apart from any, like the many other deities, uh, because he fluidly shifts between different guises. He's a fluid person. Um, because again, he could be, you know, that giant octopus, or he could be the waves, or he could be, um, you know, a whisper carried on the ocean breeze. He's shape shifting anything and everything to be. Um, you know, that mysterious fluid deity, I guess. Okay. <clears throat> um, but it's also kind of like the never ending, it's it's more symbolic because of the never ending, like, part of nature between life and death. So it's like one minute you're this, next you're that. It's kind of weirdly symbolical. Um, he has a masculine presence. Um, he is commonly associated with the color black, symbolizing the profound mysteries within the ocean depths. Um, they actually have him depicted with long flowing beard, um, because of his age and wisdom. So he is, I guess, (laughs) wizened beyond his years. Mm -hmm. Um, however, his counterpart, Kane, is different. They apparently have a lot of contrast between each other, which, I mean, again, the yin and yang kind of idea is very similar. Um, so in some myths, Kane is actually the twin brother of Kanaloa. Um, but I feel like he's probably more of the, you know, um, fraternal twin. Because of, like, the differences between the way they are, the yin and yang. I feel like that would just fit more with the yin and yang story. Um, (laughs) um, uh, Let's see. Um, There are, um, in in that myth where they're the twin brothers, they are born from the primordial goddess. Oh, I did not look up how to say that word. Papa... Hana Moku and the sky god Wakia. However, other legends introduce um, this different twist, suggesting that Kanaloa might be actually be the son of Kane and the earth goddess Haumia. Haumia. Um, but again, because of the layer of mystery that Kanaloa has with the origins of who he is, what he looks like, it just adds to that mysterious um, background that he, you know, no one knows about because a lot of their <clears throat> stories are passed down verbally <laughs> and not necessarily written down a lot. So that's unfortunate, but yeah. Um, I feel like that happens with a lot of indigenous. Um, yeah. Birth- Cause that was, that was, that's a big part of their culture. Also storytelling yeah i mean even in spaceship earth down at disney i mean that's what they're doing they're storytelling everything Mm -hmm. good times (laughs) um despite all of this the common thing between kane and kanaloa whether or not they're father son brothers um they're the same they're twins whatever um they are actually inseparable um because of their dance of creation and destruction between the two um so 
it's their relationship essentially shapes a lot, if not most, of the Hawaiian mythological cosmos. Oh. Um, so he, Kanaloa is also, has some other names. He can be, he's recognized by the name Tangaroa. Um, he is also known as Kaoolawe, which is an island with historical significance. It bears the alternative name Kanaloa. Um, he is also linked to the ag agricultural god Lono and the bountiful treasures concealed within the Earth's steps. Um, so he can be referred to as Lono Kanaloa. Um, so another, they also, some people believe that he is the darker version of Kane because of, you know, the, again, the yin and yang aspect. So they can all, they also call him Kane Hekili, Hekili, um, because of the destructive force that he has versus Kane's creation. Um, He's also, he has the title Mo'o Kanaloa uh, because of his shape-shifting abilities and his association with the lizard gods of the underworld. The island of Ka'o, uh, Ka'o Ulawe <laughs> is considered sacred to Kanaloa and it stands as a testament to his influence. It's barren yet potent manifestation of his spiritual presence. So, that's cool. Um, Kanaloa's diverse identities are further revealed through alternative names such as Kane Makua, uh, which is portraying him as a paternal figure, um, you know, woven into the cyclical, cyclical nature of life and death alongside with Kane. Um, the name Aka unveils the unseen and shadowy aspects of the ocean. So that's also another name that he can go by or what some people can refer to him as. Um, as he is, you know, the god of a lot of things, such as the sea and the underworld, um, he governs the abundant marine life that the oceans provide. Um, he also can provide guidance to seafarers on their voyages. Um, he also played a pivotal role in the creation of life with Kane. Um, so he is quite the, um... He's quite the go-getter, to be honest. Um, he is also regarded as a master of transformation and a teacher of magic. So um, he regulates the ebb and flow of tides and currents, safely guiding navigators through perilous waters and commanding the respect of all deep-sea creatures. Um, beyond that physical realm, he's associated with healing, magic, and the enigmatic mysteries of the underworld. Um, so fishermen and voyagers will often invoke Kanaloa for protection and that guidance during their, um, endeavors. Uh, they recognize him as the guardian of the sea. So they request his specific, you know, guidance for safe travels. Um, uh, da -da 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 -da. So one of his abilities lies in his connection to healing. So the Hawaiian tradition in Hawaiian tradition, the sea is revered as a source of rejuvenation and restoration. And the Kanaloa is invoked in healing rituals where practitioners harness the god's power to promote both physical and spiritual well-being. Which is really weird considering he's the god of the underworld. Now, I don't know mm -hmm. if... Like, there's not much saying that, like, much more about the fact that he is the god of the underworld, but... Yeah. I wonder if it's just because of he's i wonder if like through traditions of passing down stories and all of that if it's actually made him like maybe he's not the true god of the underworld like maybe he's the um because he's the counterpart of kane who is the god of creation maybe that's just kind of like the title that was yeah given to him but um let's see So, specifically for modern-day influence, um, 
he's actually featured in Lego's Bionicle series. Um, he's highlighted by the distinctive pattern in um, his eye, uh, known as the Aka Web or the Web of Life, um, because it encapsulates the profound interconnecting of all life throughout the world um, that exists through all things. And it goes beyond the confines of mythology um, through, you know, finding expression in traditional chants and prayers, as well as the deep respect accorded to the ocean and its diverse habitants. Um, it's also evident in the, um, uh, what is it? He's also consistently spoken about between life and death because that is like the epicenter of the hawaiian traditions like the thank you for this bring it back down thank you for right. this kind of thing um so yeah kanaloa the god of the underworld i guess <laughs> and the oceans um let's see Okay, so now Kane. Now again, I'm not going to say much about him just because he is vastly interconnected with the creation of life, but um, he's essentially the god of all creation. Not all creation, I shouldn't say that, just of life in general, whether that's like you know how Maui's saying um, like, I buried an eel or I killed an eel, I buried its guts and it sprouted now you have coconuts that's the kind of creation okay not like god created adam and eve kind of like creation like i did this like he helped um create life to help sustain it basically okay. that's kind of what i'm understanding from this <clears throat> Um, again, he's, you know, one of the highest of the deities in the Hawaiian mythology. Uh, he is stated as being one of the brothers with Lona, Lono, Kanaloa, and Ku. Um, he is worshipped as the ancestor of commoners and chiefs. He, um, is basically the creator and gives life to the elements and no human sacrifice was required for his worship because of this um he's depicted as a rare and tall um like conical stone that you can put on like your altars for when you want to bring his presence to um the hawaiian altar altars um tiki's that represent kane is quite distinct from the ones that are associated with the other major gods um but he has like a headdress on his head so like whenever you see like a tiki head um and it's got like a, an elaborate headdress um that's kane um there is a grimace or a fearsome look on his face as well um and it's that's kind of usual I guess from all the gods when they make tiki heads but basically that's kind of how he is um you know, depicted. Okay. Now, what's weird, though, is that they're, you know how, like, Kanaloa was like, oh, yeah, he's got this and a long beard, and it shows how his age, and it's like, okay, but, like, where's Kane's? So, I I know he ain't, I know he ain't just, like, some, <laughs> oh, you do? Okay, good. I was gonna say, I know he ain't just some fucking tiki head floating around it's kind of like crash bandicoot <laughs> yeah but um all right so uh so according to legend there was nothing but darkness at the beginning and darkness is also called poe i guess after realizing that he was separated from the group kane performed an act of sheer will and freed himself from the endless black chaos um, Lono and Ku also pulled themselves free, and the light created by Kane then pushed back Poe. 
Uh, the presence of Lono and Ku helped create the universe. Together, they created all the lesser gods. The three gods then created the Mene Huni. And that's kind of what started, you know, the uh, the servants and blah, 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 blah um, of the world. But it's weird because they don't mention Conalona. Uh, not Conalona. Yeah, Conalona. Conaloa. Damn it. <laughs> um, he is also known as Thunderer. Or breaking through heaven, Kane Wahi Lani, and lightning flashing in the heavens, and that's a very long name. Kaulia Nui Maka Kehali Kalani, I think. Okay. Um, he was the creator of all things and had almost complete powers in the universe, as life was sacred to him and he gave life to all living things. Human sacrifice was not expected, and it better not have been happening. Um, he was was supposed to have a dazzling phallus <laughs> like the Polynesian trickster hero Maui. <laughs> That's great. He was also the maker of the upper heaven, the lower heaven, and the earth. Now I wonder what the upper and lower heaven. Do you have? I are do. we going to talk about that too? We are. Okay, good. I was like, what the fuck? How can you have two different heavens? But anyways. Uh, so, some modern day influence. Um, one of the most iconic associations with Hawaiian islands is the Greeting Aloha, which, you know, has become synonymous with the islands. But the traditional Greeting Aloha was first said while people were touching their foreheads and exchanging breath of air. I can't wait to tell Will that because he hate anytime I get close to his face, he's like, you're breathing my air, you're breathing my air. And he gets really, really frustrated. And he went to Hawaii for uh, a trip once. So I'm going to get into his face and say it with my forehead to him and breathe his air. <laughs> it's believed that this is a reflection of the legend, which states that the breath of life was given by the gods, especially Kane. Yeah, well, I'm going to go into a little more detail about that as well, so. Perfect. Well, you know what? I can't wait to be like, aloha, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, so that's all I'm going to say about Kane. I'm going to talk about um, kind of their, like, journey. Um, are you going to say a story about fresh water? No. Okay, good. Because I have a, I have a story about it. Um, okay. Here is the story. The Quest for Fresh Water is what it's called. So Kane and Kanaloa, revered deities in Hawaiian mythology, observed that many parts of the islands were suffering from drought and a scarcity of fresh water. Kane, the god of creation and life, decided to embark on a mission to bring life-sustaining water to the dry lands, with Kanaloa, the god of the ocean, as his companion. Together, they journeyed across the Hawaiian islands to ensure that every corner received the vital resource of fresh water. Their first step was Maui, an island known for its diverse landscapes. As they traveled, they noticed the lands were parched and the people were struggling. Kane, using his divine powers, struck the earth with his staff. From this spot, a spring of fresh water burst forth. The water flowed generously, creating streams and rivers that nourished the land, turning it green and fertile. The inhabitants rejoiced as their crops flourished and their thirst was quenched. Next, they ventured to Molokai, Malokai, Molokai, Malokai, some, an island often regarded for its strong sense of community and spirituality. Here, the land was equally dry. Once again, Kane used his divine staff and fresh water gushed from the ground. This not only revived the land, but also reaffirmed the connection between the gods and the people. The new water sources provided by Kane became sacred, often revered and protected by the locals. Their journey continued to uh, Oahu, where the lands were suffering from drought. Kane and Kanaloa climbed the mountains of Oahu, seeking the perfect spot to bring forth water. 
When Kane struck the ground, a powerful stream erupted, cascading down the mountains and forming waterfalls and rivers. This water system transformed Oahu, supporting the growth of lush forests and abundant agriculture. The streams were not just practical resources, but also became the places of spiritual significance and community gathering. Throughout their journey, Kane and Kanaloa's actions underscored the balance and harmony essential to Hawaiian life. Kane's fresh water nurtured the land, while Kanaloa, with his knowledge of the ocean, guided their steps and ensured that the freshwater sources integrated seamlessly with the natural world. Their collaboration between land and sea symbolized the interconnectedness of all elements in nature and of the divine. The legend of Kane and Kanaloa's quest for fresh water left an inedible mark. Indelible. In- yep. <laughs> you saw it. You saw it. Indelible mark on Hawaiian culture. Fresh, <laughs> fresh water sources like springs, rivers, and waterfalls are often considered sacred, with many locations named after these deities or their legendary deeds. Festivals and rituals frequently honor these gods, celebrating their contributions and the life-giving waters they provided. This myth exemplifies the deep respect and reverence Hawaiians hold for their natural resources. The story of Kane and Kanaloa is not just a tale of divine intervention, but a lesson in stewardship, balance, and the harmonious coexistence with nature. Humans. Fuck off. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah. All right. So enjoy your water while you got them nice and be nice to nature because they deserve love too yeah yeah okay all right well so i am going to talk a lot about connie i'm going to talk about the creation myth and then i have a yeah that that's where we're going to start so you're going to hear a little bit of repeat there was a couple of things that i'm going to talk about that emily mentioned but most of mine is going to go a little into more detail. So, Kane is the leading god of the great gods. So, of those four that we discussed, Kane is like the the leader, I guess. He's like the the Zeus <laughs> kind of vibe. Um, he is the god of procreation and worshipped as an ancestor of chiefs and commoners. So he does do creation in the Adam and Eve variety. So there's multiple creation myths. There's like different versions, just like there was with Greek and Norse. Different scholars or historians have different opinions or different ideas. Um, But it starts with him forming the three worlds. The upper world or the upper heaven is the heaven of the gods. So that's like Olympus. That's where the gods live. The lower heaven, which is the layer right above earth, is where humans or animals or spirits go. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and then... Where the fuck does the underworld come in then? I don't know, this doesn't talk about... Is that earth? (laughs) (laughs) Then earth itself... (laughs) Well, and I don't know, obviously, I don't come at me for this, but, like, is the underworld, like, the realm of monsters? Like, is oh. that all the time? I don't know. Yeah, because that's the deep sea, too. Yeah, I haven't gotten that Thank far, you, but I'm, I'm guessing Moana. that's it. Um, <laughs> we know how Disney likes to, to tweak myths, though, and take them out of context, so we'll see. But so true, so true. He then he made the earth itself, which was um ugh, excuse me, described as a garden for mankind. However, at first there was no mankind. Um when they first made well, I'm gonna go into more detail about the creation myths here in a minute, but I'm gonna finish talking a little bit more about how Kane is worshipped. So his worshippers are called Papa La'a. Um, and what a common like greeting or mantra that they would say is life is sacred to, K- to Kane. Um, because of that, 
because he's the creator of all all of the life. Um, like Emily said, the rituals and worship for Kane did not involve sacrifice or like you know how Hercules had to do his labors or whatever. Um, there's not anything like that when it comes to worshiping Kane either. Um, altars in honor of him are called Pahako Okane. Um, and they consist of that tall conical stone, one to eight feet tall, typically. And it's either going to be pl plain or have a light carving. And then another common um, item on these altars is a plant called tea, T-I, um, which is a plant with like longer green, like palm-like leaves, frond-like leaves, um, except they're green and pink. They have like a pink tinge. They're really pretty. I highly recommend looking them up. Um, okay. Family members would go to this altar to pray to their um, Aumakua, which is like a family deity or ancestor. Ooh. And they would ask for forgiveness for the Tapu incident, which we will discuss that later, because there is this one incident that happens uh, with the first man and woman that um, everyone assumes all of the bad things or misfortunes that happen are associated with that incident. They also would typically come early in the morning and bring offerings and prayer. There's a there was a story about they would eat some kind of snack while a pig was roasting on the spit, and then they would um, have like a feast, basically, while um, worshiping him. But the Aumakua is like a version of Kane. So like, for example, some people specifically um, on the island of Maui worship Kane as um, Kane Hekili, which is Kane of Thunder, like you mentioned earlier. Um, and they would worship him specifically when humpbacked forms are being led through the air by the humpbacked brothers of Pele. Um, so those big, like, clouds, basically. Storm clouds are being led through the air. Um, when a storm like this with those types of clouds are coming, they take all containers or anything that can hold water and they turn it upside down. And then they lay flat on the ground with face down and they be completely silent because otherwise it's going to get you. I don't know. Um, and they, there are actually two stones that look like humans laying face down um, somewhere in Hawaii on, on the Island of Maui. And it's like a folk tale that those were two young boys who weren't quiet during the storm. And, um, they were turned to stone by Pele's brothers. Um, Damn. So. Lesson learned. Shut the fuck up. That's one version of like Kane being an ancestral deity specific to like their family. So that's one of his like iterations. Um, there are a lot more versions of Kane, but we would be here all day if I tried to discuss them all. And this, my part of this episode is supposed to be more about worshiping him and why they worship him, which comes to the creation myth. So there were um, a total of four eras um, of Kane. The first one is when Kane is dwelling alone in continual darkness. Um, and then Emily kind of talked about that going into the second era. He breaks out of that darkness and light is created. And then Ku, Lono, and Kane work together to create the earth and the plants and animals and other natural things. But not humans. Just animals, plants, and rocks, and earth, and all that. 
that's the second era. The third era, they're like, what did we make all of this for? And they basically, the vibe of from some of the historians was he was lonely and he wanted a companion. So he creates Kumahanua, which is man, and Lalohanua, which is woman. And can we talk about the fact that Lalohanua is woman and the realm of monsters is called Lalotai? <laughs> that feels feels connected but we'll find out later are monsters born of women right. because of men well give me a minute because we're going to talk about this here in a minute and i'm like really so first the man was created because of course he was um he was made of earth they created like this humanoid form out of earth white clay was the head they used red earth mixed with spit for the body Mm. Um, and then Kane and Ku breathed into his two nostrils and Lono breathed into the mouth to bring him to life. So the, the breath of these three gods brought this clay creature to life as a human. God, I can't wait to go. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs> Which is where that comes from. So they named this man Kelii. Hold on, let me start over. Kelii Kuhanoa. Uh, anyway. Um, and they create this beautiful garden for him to live in. It's not called Eden, though. No, it's called Kalani I Haola, which I think you talked about maybe earlier as one of the islands is called that. Maybe. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I said a lot of words I'm not used to saying. Um. So there are some versions of this story that um, he sees his shadow, the man does, and he's like, what is that? Like, I don't, like, I, why is it following me? And because of that, um, the gods are like, oh, he needs a companion. Um, and so they create woman. They create her out of his right side. That's that's all it said. They just create her out of his right side in this myth. Um, and they call her Keola Kuahanua. Um, and she lives in this garden with him as well, where there are lots of different kinds of dogs, pigs, mo, uh, which are shape shifting guardian lizards. <laughs> And a tapu tree. So the tapu tree has apples. And if a stranger eats these apples, they cause death. Um, and the bark of this tree is forbidden to all but the high chief. So that law, I th in this myth, that law that the bark can only, or is forbidden to all but the high chief, was given to man and man broke that law. And because of that, he was driven out of the garden and given mortality. So he now will die at some point. He eventually does and then is brought back to this island and buried here. But um, a different version of that part of the myth and also a later version. Um, just just see if this sounds familiar at all. Mm -hmm. um, Lalo Hanua, which is woman, meets a great white seabird that stands while fishing, and it seduces her into eating the sacred apples. This drives her mad, and she turns into a bird. The seabird carries them both, both her and the man, away from the garden. They become lost, and because um, Kumahanua didn't stop her from eating the apples, He's punished with mortality. And it's all the woman's fault. No one Sound familiar at all? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's a later version. And some scholars are like, is that, is that Western or not Western, Eastern? 
I don't know. Is that the um, European culture's influence on Hawaiian legends? Kind of feels like it. Um, but that is the end of the third era. Because this whole time, Kane has been living on Earth with man. Um, and because they broke the sacred law, he's like, nope, fuck you guys. And he goes to live in heaven. In the upper heaven. Um, and the man who has broken Kane's law is made mortal. Um, so, yeah, that's 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 basically what I have. But all of this information came from Hawaiian Mythology by Martha Beckwith, which is a book. But also, that book can be found in PDF form on the website ulukau.org and then, you know, slash book slash blah, 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 blah. Um, if anyone's interested in that, let us know and I can send you the link if you want to read more. Because in the chat that in the Kane worship, the Kane worship um, chapter of that book, it talks about a lot more of the um, Aumakua versions of Kane. Um, so like the different ancestral versions of Kane and um, how those different versions would be worshipped. Uh, but we would have been here for 17 years if I talked about all of them <laughs> because there was a lot there. But if anyone's interested in learning more about that, let me know and I will send you the link. Or you can just, this book was on Amazon. Um, I bought a used copy for like $13. Why Mythology by Martha Beckwith, who yes. studied at the University of Honolulu, I believe. So you said <clears throat> that you didn't know if there was like a lot of Christian influence. And I actually have like a blurb on my Kane research about Christian influence. Or at least like Western contact. Would it even be Western contact? I feel like it would be Eastern for them because it's coming from the other direction. That's why I, I could stop myself and got confused and said European. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So basically, with the arrival of missionaries um, and the spread of Christianity, it actually had quite the profound influence on Hawaiian mythology. Um, the introduction of new beliefs and religious practices brought significant changes to like the very traditional Hawaiian spiritual system, um, including the perception and worship of Kane and other deities. As Christianity had gained influence in Hawaii, the, the indigenous Hawaiian beliefs were often suppressed or assimilated to the new religion. Um, the concept of monotheism clashed with the polytheistic nature of the Hawaiian mythology. So it marginalized Kane and other gods in favor of the Christian god, obviously, um, mm -hmm. because missionary discouraged uh, the worship of multiple deities because of it being considered pagan and idol idolatrous idolatrous um so there's actually been a, a decline in the traditional hawaiian religious practices uh due to um western ideologies merging and like forcing themselves on it mm -hmm. um with the loss of that native hawaiian language and the disruption of cultural practices due to colonization um and like the merging of cultures knowledge about kane and other gods have become quite scarce um and many traditional stories rituals and chants were at risk of being forgotten or diluted um so there has actually been quite a resurgence of interest in hawaiian mythology and um and like you know the efforts to revive and restore the ancient traditions despite like the colonization um, Native Hawaiians, cultural practitioners, and scholars are working hard to document and revive the stories, which rituals and symbolism associated with the Hawaiian mythology around Kane and other deities. So, um, 
there's actually been quite a growing awareness and appreciation for the spiritual heritage of Hawaii, um, specifically through language revitalization, um, educational programs, and community initiatives. And actually, you can learn um, Hawaiian through Duolingo. Oh. So sometimes when I'm waiting for like my um, lesson to upload or anything like that, um, then you just have to, you know, worry or not worry. You just have to, um, you can flip to Hawaiian and you can actually get that has something that you can do. So until next time. Bye.